right, so good morning, good afternoon, everyone. We've got folks joining us from all across Canada and all around the world today, and welcome into another exciting Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants program. If you're joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And I am so thrilled today because today continues our epic Peak Summit Discovery Series with the Parks Canada team. If you guys have been following along on our Peak website, we have been featuring programs in Banff and Jasper and Waterton Lakes, all these amazing places, not just in Canada, but around the world, truly special locations that hopefully as Canadians, and we've got a lot of Canadians today, you get the chance to visit in person someday soon. I know we've got a huge Alberta audience as well today, so welcome in everyone local and close to our park. Now we feature bison, we feature bats and fire and all these amazing topics, but what happens when you actually go to a park? How do you prepare for that? What are some things that you should look out for and think of before you head to one of our really iconic places? Well, that is what we're going to talk about today with Kelsey, who's joining us to talk about the Leave It Wild ethos. How to be park smart when you're going to parks, what can you do to prepare? I am so, so excited. I've had the chance to visit some national parks in person myself. They're some of my most treasured memories. And so today we are going to learn from the best possible guide how you can prep before you go to these special places. So Kelsey, thank you so much for joining us and in such an incredible area too i might add and take us away <laughs> thanks so much jesse hi everyone my name is kelsey i work for parks canada with the public outreach and education team and today i am coming to you live from the beautiful lake louise which you can see behind me uh, it's clearly a winter wonderland here but jesse can you show everyone what this place looks like during the summer Beautiful. So Lake Louise is in Banff National Park, which we acknowledge is within the present day territories of Treaty 6, 7 and 8, as well as the Métis homeland. The lands and waters of Banff National Park have been used for millennia by Indigenous peoples for sustenance, ceremony, trade and travel. We thank them for their continuous stewardship and for sharing the land with us. And what an incredible land that is. Let me do a quick swivel with the camera here just so you can kind of check out the full view around Lake Louise here. So I'd like you to compare this national park with your favorite local park. So think about the sorts of the kind of things that you see in your local park. Take a moment and then share in the chat. For example, if your favorite local park is the playground down the street, you might type um, kids, swings, monkey bars, and seagulls. So take a moment, share in the chat, and let us know what kind of things do you see in your favorite local park. Ooh, so anyone's welcome to do that on YouTube and our StreamYard chat, of course. We've already got questions pouring in, but let us know your favorite park. I know for me, my favorite park growing up had a lot of squirrels. I grew up in Toronto, so there's about 10,000 squirrels per person in the city of Toronto. Uh, we're famous for that. A lot of blue jays and, I, you know, just sort of those iconic Canadian animals. I know you've got some bigger iconic Canadian animals out there. Miss Kravis's class saying birds. If you're on YouTube, don't be shy. So birds, you've got some mammals, all sorts of neat little wildlife uh, landscapes, baseball, diamonds now, squirrels, birds, rabbits, deer. Great answers, guys. <laughs> I love that. Thanks, everyone. So clearly, not all parks are the same. So when people come to the mountains and visit the national parks, they don't always know what to expect or how to behave. And I'm going to share some real examples of this, real situations that have happened in the park and things that have gone wrong. So Jesse, we can queue up video number one. Thank you. 
garbage. Hey folks, sorry about that. Let me pause our video. Sorry, teachers just mentioning they couldn't hear the video. We tested that right before the broadcast. I'm sorry, I don't know what was going on there. Let's, um, sorry about this, Kelsey. I'm gonna try and cue this up again and see if we can get it uh, going where everyone can hear it. Um, let me know, guys. The audio should be sharing. We're gonna try this one more time. I apologize for the trouble. We're visiting the site of a- Kelsey, can you hear this? Yeah, I can hear it now. Okay, good. Sorry about the trouble, everybody. Grizzly bear, known as Bear 142, took her cubs for a walk through the campground. The bear stopped to investigate a tent where a young man was sleeping with just this much fabric between himself and the bears. So he woke up immediately and started yelling. Other campers saw this happening from their vehicle and made enough noise on the horn to scare the bears away. Parks Canada staff were called in to help and they discovered why the bears had stopped. There was food inside the tent. Bears have an incredible sense of smell, one of the best in the animal kingdom. They can detect food from many kilometers away. And it's not just food. Uh, barbecues, stoves, pots and pans, pet food and bowls, toiletries, garbage, all these scented items will attract bears and other animals too. If you're headed to bed or just stepping away from your campsite, make sure that it's clean before you go. You can safely store items in a vehicle or hard-sided trailer or put them into a bear-proof food locker. Garbage goes into a bear-proof bin. Now that is a lot to remember, so Parks Canada has a bear campsite program that explains how and why to keep your campsite clean. If you're wondering what happened to the bears, this story has a happy ending. When Bear 142 returned to the campground later that summer, she passed through without incident. Bears naturally avoid people, but when they learn to connect people with food, that changes. Bears can become food conditioned and habituated. They search out human food and lose their natural fear of people. That's really dangerous for us, and it can also result in the bear being put down. For safety, Parks Canada put a temporary rule in place at the campground. Only hard-sided trailers allowed, so no tents that the bears might explore for food. These temporary rules, called restricted activity orders, are really important to pay attention to. Always check for signs at trailheads or campgrounds, or check online before you visit. Perfect. All right, Kelsey, we're back with you. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks, Jesse. To follow up on that video, I have a true false question for everyone. So get ready to type your answer into the chat. True or false, the BEAR Campsite Program, B-A-R-E, the BEAR Campsite Program protects visitors and keeps animals wild and alive. True or false? Hmm, I got a good feeling on this one. We got our first answers coming in in the chat. True, true. We got true with three exclamation marks, which is pretty good, Kelsey. I think that's a good sign. Yeah. We <laughs> that's us. a resounding <laughs> answer. I like it. So yes, the answer is true. A BEAR Campsite, B-A-R-E, a BEAR Campsite, is a clean campsite that doesn't attract animals like Bear 142. It's safer for visitors and for wildlife. When animals are attracted to campgrounds or roadsides, they're more likely to be hit by a vehicle or come into conflict with humans. And animals need natural food, not human food, to stay healthy. Jesse, we can play video number two. All right, teachers can give me a thumbs up to make sure that the audio plays in this one. We're going to get this guy up and, uh, oh, there's so many things going on. There we are. Let's get started. In the summer of 2019, I was guiding a group of hikers down the Steps Stanley Glacier Trail when something unexpected happened. On the final stretch of trail, I heard a yell behind me. I turned around to see Jane, one of the hikers, sprawled on the ground. Jane sat up right away, but looked very shaky and was cradling her right arm. She said she just tripped over a rock that landed very awkwardly. So I did some first aid, and after a rest, Jane felt strong enough to walk back to the trailhead. Jane's husband took her to the nearest hospital where she was treated for what turned out to be a broken wrist. 
Not the best ending to a day of hiking, but it could have been a lot worse. Let me show you a different scenario. This time, Jane is alone and far from the trailhead. And this time, she rolls her ankle so badly that she can't put any weight on it. What does Jane do? Well, first she tries to use her phone, but here in the mountains, there's no service. So she tries yelling, but no one else is around. She tries to set up her hiking poles like crutches, where she can crop out, but that's painful and exhausting. Jane is in serious trouble. She can't walk out, she can't call for help, no one knows where she is, and now it's starting to get cold, rainy, and dark. In the national parks, even small accidents can have serious and sometimes deadly consequences. Here's how you can be better prepared for a hike. First, tell someone, hey, this is where I'm going, this is when I expect to return, if I don't get back, please call for help. Number two, Bring someone. There is safety in numbers, so whenever possible, hike with a friend or your family. Number three, get a satellite communication device like a spot or an in-reach and know how to use it. Your cell phone isn't reliable here. And then finally, number four, bring extra gear. So you should always have essentials like uh, food and water but warm layers like a down jacket, hat, toque, rain jacket, those are really important too because weather changes so quickly in the mountains. If preparing for a visit to the national parks is something that your parents usually take care of, I really encourage you to get involved. Ask questions, check out resources like Parks Canada web pages and do some reading. When you get to the national park, Keep asking those questions. Stop at a visitor center and talk to park staff. We are here to help. <laughs> Thanks, Jesse. So I, I really love how the videos themselves help reinforce the message that weather changes. Because when we started filming, it was nice and bright and warm and sunny. And clearly by the end of the day, by the end of that video, um, it's snowing quite hard. So even if the weather is beautiful at the trailhead, when you start your hike, when you start your day, it could look very different in a couple of hours. Now, in terms of packing for a hike, there's one important item that I didn't mention. Does anyone know what this is? And if you do, go ahead and type your answer in the chat. Oh, don't don't turn it too much. Oh, no, 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 no. We don't want to give it away right on the bottle. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, keep cheering in the chat. You guys have been so, so good in the chat today. Miss L's class, right with it with bear spray. Bear spray, we got horn. So I think some of our Alberta classes might know what's going on here. So bear spray, is that correct, Kelsey? <laughs> yes, absolutely. This is bear spray. Uh, so if you encounter a bear and it charges, the bear spray can help protect you and send the bear away. It's like, imagine getting sprayed in the face with incredibly concentrated, spicy, hot pepper juice. Yeah, bears don't like it either. Make sure that when you hike with bear spray, it's easy to access. So right at your hip, um, on the outside of your backpack, not buried inside, and also that you know how to use it. So at the end of the program, we'll share a link to a video of a bear spray demonstration. Please go ahead and check that out later. Jesse, we can queue up video number three. Jesse, I don't hear the audio. Well, chase the deer away. How about now when I come in? <laughs> so weird. Let's um. Yelling and sorry, let me six. let me cue that up from the beginning, people. I'm really sorry about that. That's very unusual that it's doing that for us today. Site, Here we go. We'll get it up. <laughs> On the afternoon of June 26, the campers at site B17 were sitting back and relaxing when a deer walked past. The deer took notice of their leashed dog, started acting aggressive, and then charged the dog. 
The campers chased the deer away. It moved on to another site. Then the deer came back and it took a second effort of yelling and throwing sticks to chase the deer away. Parks Canada staff were called to investigate and determined that the deer was a female and likely, likely had a little fawn nearby that she ran big. This deer incident is an important reminder that all wildlife can be dangerous, whether it's big, small, has claws, or eats grass. One thing you can do to stay safe and respect wildlife is give space. How much space? Well, this wildlife viewing card can tell you. I'll show you how it works. You see those animals over there? In the southern end of Kootenai National Park, open grasslands are home to bighorn sheep. I know I'm a safe distance away, way, because when I hold the card at arm's length, the sheep fit within the box. You should give predators like bears at least 100 meters of space or 10 bus lengths. Other animals need 30 meters or three bus lengths. Sometimes even that's not enough. Parks Canada will close small areas to limit human disturbance and keep people safe. For example, the Bow River Loop Trail was closed last summer from July 21st to September 15th because grizzly bears, bears were using the area. By giving animals space and staying out of closed areas, you can help us balance human use and wildlife protection in the parks. The good news is that's our last video, so you don't need to see me screw up anymore, everybody. Kelsey, take us away. <laughs> All good. Thanks, Jesse. So if you want your own wildlife viewing card to test out, we'll share a link to a printable version at the end of the program. Or when you visit the national parks, you can pick up a viewing card from the Lake Louise, Yoho, or Kootenai visitor centers. So keep that in the back of your mind. And now for the last true-false question. You should stay at least 30 meters or three bus lengths away from deer, elk, and moose. True or false? Mm -hmm. Moose might give like 35, uh, but I think we're, <laughs> we know what we're going for here together. True. Oh, true, false, false. Wow, we've got like Discord in our teacher community today. True, false. We got two falses so far. I don't know. I'm thinking this is a good lead in true, true and false, Miss Kravis's class. Very, very equivocating of you. So tell okay, us so, <laughs> some split answers there. So for deer, elk, and moose, some of those hooved animals, 30 meters or three bus lengths is a safe distance. If you're viewing something like a bear or a wolf, a bigger predator, that's when you want to stay 100 meters or 10 bus lengths away. So depending on the type of animal, you might need to give it more or less space. But if you go ahead and print one of those wildlife viewing cards off, the answers or the, the hint to the answer will be on the card. It'll tell you exactly how far to stay away from those animals. And the, the most important message, I think, to keep in mind is just to give all animals space and treat them with respect. So that includes not feeding animals. They don't need a bite of your sandwich. They need to find their own natural food sources to stay healthy. Every summer here on the shore of Lake Louise, we actually have a big problem with ground squirrels because people have fed them in the past. So the ground squirrels will chew through backpacks. They follow and harass people and also bite. It's really not a good situation and you can do your part to help keep wildlife wild by not feeding animals and giving them space. So Jesse, that wraps up the main part of the presentation here. I think we can dive into the Kahoot quiz. I am so excited. So for those of you who are familiar with this, we've done these Kahoot quizzes at the end of our programs over the last, the whole Park Peaks Canada series. Um, but today we're gonna do a little bit differently. We are gonna have our exciting Kahoot as a big part of the broadcast together. So after every question, we're gonna have a chance to walk through why that's the answer with Kelsey, have a little bit of fun. I put up the game pin for everybody. I'll put that in, in a bigger format on the bottom of the screen. I put it on our YouTube chat as well. So 772-5142. And Kelsey, we're gonna dive in in a second and see what answers we get from all our fantastic participants, over 50 of you in so far. For those who are new to this, the faster you answer, the more points you get. Let's dive in everybody. All right, three, two, one till our first question. Okay, one of eight. Your family's camping in a national park. 
Where should you store food? We talked about this at the beginning of the broadcast. Who was listening? In a tent? On top of the picnic table? Inside a vehicle? Or in a cooler? Now, I'll tell you, when I've been in a national park once, I left some cereal on top of a table, and I came back, and a raccoon was literally sitting upright eating the cereal and gave me a look like, this is my cereal, right? So maybe not on the picnic table. 64 answers, Kelsey. So our, our tally is most people said inside a vehicle. Is that correct? Tell us more. That is correct. Fantastic. Yeah, I noticed that in a cooler got a few answers there. Um, and that is a common misconception. Coolers might look safe, but bears, other animals, they can easily get into those coolers. So always make sure that your food is going inside a vehicle or a hard sided trailer. That's the best place to store it. Or if the particular campground has food lockers that are designed for bears and wildlife. Yeah, if people want to check that out again, these YouTube recordings will stay up forever. So if you want to see what one of those bear lockers looks like, you can also head to the National Park sites, of course, and check those out on the website. Uh, but very, very cool stuff. Let's head to our second question. After noting that Champion Lemur is currently in the lead, and please do let us know who you are at the end of the broadcast, too. All right, what is a habituated animal? Kelsey, our answer, an animal that's lost its fear of people, animal that eats plants, an animal that does the same thing every day, sometimes I feel that way, or a viral TikTok video. I'm going to go out on a limb and guess it might not be our fourth one, but the picture might give some help for everybody. Three seconds left, get those answers in, everybody. All right. So most of you said an animal that's lost its fear of people with a few people that said the same thing every day. Kelsey, tell us more. Yeah, so we call animals habituated when they've had too many interactions with humans, when they're really used to being around humans and they've lost their fear. That can really change their natural behavior and that often leads to conflict and problems that could end up with that animal being put down. So always make sure that you're following the rules, you're giving those animals space and not feeding them. Yeah. We had a teacher in the chat that mentioned vermouth 50 meters in, in running season. So you want to make sure we're just giving animals that respect, that space, no matter whether they're predators, herbivores. It doesn't matter. A lot of people instinctually think, oh, it's a moose. It's a deer. You know, get up and close. And that's not necessarily the case. So uh, Amazing Panda takes our lead in our Kahoot quiz barely over Champion Lemur. We will go to our third question now. You should never feed wildlife. Why? Kelsey, do you want to read off these answers if you can see them? <laughs> Yeah, so food attracts wildlife to roadsides and human areas. You could get injured. Wildlife need to find natural food to stay healthy or all of the above. All right, we got a bunch of answers. 10 more coming in, two seconds left, two seconds left. And all, ooh, that's interesting. A few of you might have jumped the gun there with A and C. No one said you could get injured, but quite a few of you over a quarter said that all of the above is our correct answer. So yes, Kelsey. Yeah, so it's, it's okay if you jumped the gun, you were on the right track because all of those answers were correct. There's lots of different reasons for not feeding wildlife. We really need to let them do their own thing and find their own food in the park. Yeah, fantastic. All right, let's head to question number four. We're ripping through these. I love this Kahoot format, by the way, for all our other Parks Canada staff that are watching this in advance of their program. This is brilliant. <laughs> all right, true or false? Easy one and a little bit shorter. Cell phones always get good service in national parks. Who was watching that video about the hiker on the trail? Three seconds left. Get those answers in. And our answer is, most of you said false, and you are correct. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Don't rely on your cell phone here in the national parks. Even today at Lake Louise, which is a very popular spot, I had to walk around last week to find this exact place where the service was good. Don't rely on your cell phones in the park. Make sure, if, especially if you're headed into the back country, out on the trail, that you have one of those satellite communication devices with you. Well, and may I say that we are very thrilled that you did take the time to find a spot on Lake Louise because <laughs> it is extraordinary. All right, Decisive Frog keeps our lead. Let's keep it going, everybody, with question number five. All right, back to a quiz. You're getting ready for a hike. It looks sunny. What should you bring in your backpack? Da, 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 da. Sunscreen and a hat, a selfie stick, warm layers and a rain jacket, or both A and C? Hmm. Do we need that selfie stick? Do we need two, maybe? Maybe that's why it's not right. I don't know. Three selfie sticks? 26 selfie sticks for the whole family. 60, 70 plus answers. This is great. There's so many of you playing. 
So most people got this right, both A and C. Only one person said selfie stick. They didn't listen to me, and that's the key in all the group quizzes. <laughs> Kelsey, so both A and C, tell us more. So <laughs> if you have space in your backpack, you can go ahead and bring that selfie stick. But the main message here is that you always need to be prepared for all kinds of weather, even if it's warm and sunny when you start your day. Two hours later on top of the mountain, it could be snowing and freezing cold and windy. So make sure that you always have warm layers and that you're protected from the sun with sunscreen, a sun hat. Prepare for all eventualities. Make sure you pack as many things as you can. Fantastic. And I want to go back to that video where you were in the deep snow and say how much we appreciate you filming in such conditions. So thank you for that. <laughs> Decisive Frog is just killing it. Like right on the, the ball here. Six and eight now, three quarters away done. What's the best way to prepare for a visit to the national parks? Are we bringing an extra suitcase full of candy in case you get hungry? That sounds wonderful. I must say that's why I might go for that in the future. Check out Parks Canada web pages, do lots of research, get a haircut so you look good in photos, or do nothing. What could go wrong? Come on. Uh, other than our videos, are we talking about exactly the things that could go wrong? 60 of you have gotten in, way to go. Check out Parks Canada web pages and do lots of research. 90% of you on the ball with that one. We're get, they're getting better, Kelsey. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. There are so many resources online, the Parks Canada web pages, trip planning resources. Those are a great place to look. And you can even old school call into the visitor centers and ask some direct questions before you get to the park. And then when you're here, talk to park staff, stop at a visitor center, pick up a brochure, a visitor guide, learn as much as you can, and that'll help make your visit that much more successful. Now, I know we've got a lot of Alberta classes that may have been to Jasper and Banff and Lake Louise where Kelsey's standing right now, so you will know this, but if you've never been to a Parks Canada site, you will never met friendlier, meet friendlier or more enthusiastic people than Parks Canada staff at the visitor centers. So make sure to check that out. Decisive Frog keeps our lead. Two more questions, folks. Is it going to happen? You encounter an elk on a hiking trail. What should you do? All right, get closer, take a selfie. I mean, we have those selfie sticks. Kelsey gave us permission. Do we move away slowly and give the elk lots of space? Do we take our dogs off the leash and let them chase the elk? That sounds a little, I, I don't know if that's a good idea. Or run away screaming. Elk are terrified. I mean, look at that guy. He's so big. He's got the big antlers. 70 of you have answered. All right, 95%. Look at that. Move away slowly and give the elk lots of space. Nice. Yeah, that's fantastic. Always try and stay as calm as possible. Move slowly give animals space and the dogs on leash that's one important thing because it might look a little bit different where you live locally there might be different rules about keeping your dog on leash when you come to the national parks make sure you keep your best friend leashed up um, that keeps your dog safe and the animals and other visitors around you safe as well outstanding well kelsey in advance of our eighth question coming up in a second i will just note if you're on youtube you want to start sharing questions for kelsey please start sharing in the chat live classes put those thinking caps on we are almost at our q a session but let's head into question number eight decisive frog still in the lead for like six questions now eight of eight ten seconds on this one just true or false all wildlife can be dangerous including this chipmunk adorably sitting in our picture together what do we think we did talk about ground squirrels earlier Hmm, might have been a clue. 53 answers. So quite a few of you said false. Only about 60% said true, but Kelsey, our answer is true, correct? It absolutely is. Yeah, we often only think of the big, scary, kind of predator-like animals, bears, wolves, cougars. We think of those as being dangerous, but all wildlife can be dangerous. Even if it's a ground squirrel, you get a bite, infection, a disease, something like that. So always give animals space, no matter if they're big, small, have claws, eat grass, whatever the animal looks like, give them respect and space. Yeah. I can tell you I've been in Lake Louise and had ground schools run up and try and get on my leg to eat food for me because people have fed them in the past. This is something where you don't want to have that kind of interaction with an animal, and I'm really glad we got that message in today. So Nimble Goose is our Kahoot winner, Amazon Panda, Decisive Frog. Let us know who you are in the chat. That's fantastic, guys. And Kelsey, let's dive back in with you for a little bit of a wrap-up before our Q&A session. <laughs> thanks, Jesse, and thanks everyone for taking part in the Kahoot quiz. I really like that back and forth format. That was pretty fun. Okay, so for the Q&A session, I've actually invited two people who work for Parks Canada on the front lines of visitor safety and human wildlife conflict. So these are the people who will respond if you have to call for help on your satellite communication device, or if there's an issue involving wildlife, and they do so much more. So I'm going to step aside for now and let our guests introduce themselves.
Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Kelsey. Hi, everybody. My name is Sarah. I'm a member of the Human Wildlife Coexistence Team here in Lake Louise. And so what we do is help to make sure that people and wildlife can interact safely. So sometimes that's managing wildlife traffic jams, helping to move bears through campgrounds or day use areas, working to kind of reduce the number of animals that are getting into food or getting hit on the highway and doing lots of education, like chatting with you guys today, just letting people know how humans and wildlife can stay safe together. Fantastic. All right. <laughs> Colleague number two. Hi, my name's Aaron Beardmore, and I'm a visitor safety specialist with Banff National Park. And uh, I have three main components to my job, providing backcountry search and rescue services, uh, doing avalanche control over the highway corridors that uh, travel throughout Banff, Yoho, and Kootenai National Parks. And uh, thirdly, we produce a backcountry avalanche bulletin so that uh, visitors can make informed choices before they go out to the backcountry between November and May. Fantastic. All right. So, gang, there's the three of you. Yeah. <laughs> is there more Kelsey or are we dive Jesse, in? we have a lot of deep snow around us, which is why you see us kind of switching in and out of the camera screen here. Um, it'll probably work best if the students ask their questions and then Sarah or Aaron, whoever has the best answer, they'll pop on screen with the answer and we can hear from the phone what the question is. Perfect. We don't want anyone having any safety issues during our safety issue call. That was not the exactly. you know, why we're going for. <laughs> All right. Well, let's head to Ms. Hebert's class. We're going to head to the U.S. for our first question. Actually, it's Scotch Plains, New Jersey. If you guys want to kick us off with a period, just unmute that mic. In fact, all our teachers can unmute their microphones, keep those mics ready for Q&A. And Ms. Hebert, come on in to kick us off. Hey, guys. Hi. Hi. Hi, Hi everybody. Hi. Thomas, do you have a question? Oh, okay. Kylie, do you have a question? All right. Sit down. All right, Kylie, we have one question. We're coming. Take your time. All good. How cold is it there? How cold is it? <laughs> um, I'm not wearing a hat right now. So it feels colder than it actually is. And uh, when I parked the car just above us, it was actually plus two degrees is the radiant air temperature. It feels colder than it is right now because we have a wind coming down off those glaciers. You can see right where I'm pointing and coming across the lake. It's called catabatic, catabatic wind effect. So it's a little colder than it might seem, but it's two degrees Celsius. Yeah, so we got our friends in the States too. So about 36 Fahrenheit if you're in the U.S. today. It's a pretty cold. It's a little bit warmer here where I am in southern Ontario. So exactly, yeah. No chilly. Um, all right, let's head to Miss L's class. So Miss L's class with the winner of our Kahoot quiz. So way to go, guys. I know your camera's off, but if you want to unmute your mic, you should be good to go to ask a question. Hey, hey, camera's on. Even better. Unmute your mic. Come on up. Hey, guys, and congrats. Say hi. Hi. All right, what's your question? Um, so like, what are some of the most dangerous animals? Any dangerous That's animals? That's Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a great question. Kind of like Kelsey was saying earlier, you know, any animal can be dangerous to people. Some of the most dangerous ones that we work with do tend to be bears. And most of the time, bears really want to avoid people. So they're going to stay out of your way as long as you're making noise. You know, even if they are coming through areas like a campground, they usually are just using it as a way to move through because there's so many different areas that people are in, in somewhere here like Banff. Um, but we also do work with larger animals like elk or moose, and it can be kind of difficult to move them in the right direction as well. So, so those are some of the animals that we deal with most commonly here. Yeah, I, that actually is a beautiful segue into a question where you don't have to leave the camera. I'll keep you on with us for a second. Uh, Mr. Hergut's class on YouTube wants to know how were elk managed? He's been in Banff before, he's seen elk on the side of the road. How do you actually deal with that when they're possibly getting in the way of people? Yeah, that's a great question. So we don't deal with it as much up here in Lake Louise. We do have uh, some elk that live down in field. We actually just got a call this morning. They were crossing the highway. Uh, so we were helping to make sure that they could do that safely. Uh, but in other areas, specifically in Banff, they do enter the town site a lot. And so one of the tools that we use to get 
larger animals, both uh, ungulates like uh, elk, but also uh, carnivores like bears to move in the same, in the right direction is hazing. So actually one of the very Canadian tools that we use to move elk is a, uh, a really long hockey stick. And we actually put uh, kind of tape on the top of it. And it's really interesting. They really don't like, um, you know, when you kind of move it and you show them something that kind of, uh, uh, gets their attention. So oftentimes we use our presence and we can move them in the right direction. Uh, but with elk, yeah, it's one of the ways that we do it is with a, a hockey stick with some tape on the top. <laughs> I'm so happy that your professional detachment just went right off your face as you explain that because it's the greatest and most Canadian moment of all time to scare away elk with a hockey stick. Thank you for that <laughs> in my day. All right, Miss Krause's class, heading to Pickery. Unmute your mic, guys, and come on in. And Miss Bowman will come to you guys in a second. Miss Krause, hi, guys, two, three, welcome in. Right. Do bears attack? Do you ever have any problems with bears? That's a great question. And that's a question that we get a lot of the time is whether or not bears um, attack people. So it's one of those things that we do hear about, um, especially, you know, we might read it on the internet or hear about it from people. And it can happen, but it is extremely rare. So it's something that... Um, you know, we might hear about every so often, but here in Banff, um, in Yohon Kootenai, we haven't had to deal with something like that uh, for a very long time, which is great. So some of the stuff that Kelsey was talking about earlier and some of the stuff I always tell people is, you know, having your bear spray with you, making noise, um, you know, watching for when we have uh, signage about when bears might be more often in the area or when an area is closed because of them is a great way to kind of make sure that you're staying safe. Uh, so it's something to be aware of, but it's not something that happens very often. Yeah, I'm really, really glad we got that question. Thanks, Ms. Krabs's group. All right, Ms. Bowman's class in New Jersey. I swear that the state that we get more than any other when we do these parks in Alberta is New Jersey. You're like an honorary Canadians at this point. So welcome in Ms. Bowman's group. And come on in. Hey, fifth graders. Hi. 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 So I have two questions. The first one is, what's the difference of where the bears go in the winter than the summer? And what's your second one? Um, what is the most common injury people get on the trails? Ooh, All okay. right, well, I can answer the first one and I'll give the second one to Aaron. Uh, so where bears are in the summer versus the winter, it's a great question. So as you can see right now, it's still quite snowy. So a few days ago, we actually just had our first bear sighting of the season, which is very exciting. But in the summer, bears can be anywhere. So sometimes uh, they're down in the valley. If they're you know eating berries, they can be all the way up on the mountain. Um, especially here in Banff and Yohon Kootenai, uh, really anywhere is, is bear habitat. In the winter, bears do something really cool. So they actually go to sleep for the winter. So there's nothing for them to eat. So to conserve energy, they go and they dig a den. And if you're a grizzly bear, you might go up really up high and black bears, you might stay somewhere in the forest and you won't likely see them in the winter. And we've just had our first emergence here in March. Most of our bears will be out in May. And then they'll start go. Uh, we'll start seeing them go off into different areas where they're going to den uh, in October and November. And I'll pass your second question over to Aaron. Thank you so much. <laughs> Hi, I'm glad you asked that question because uh, hands down, the most common injury is a rolled ankle. We have a lot of trails. Uh, you can actually see a lot of them. Well, you can't see them, but a lot of them are behind me. And uh, in the summertime, there'll be hundreds, if not thousands, of people hiking around in this very area and um, people of all ages and um, sometimes they'll roll an ankle and that's the most common thing. The second most common thing isn't actually an injury at all. People just get stuck and you can see a lot of cliffs behind me, one over my, what's this, right shoulder, no sorry, left shoulder here <laughs> and um, it's called the Big Beehive and it's a popular hiking trail going right up to the bottom and sometimes visitors who aren't as prepared as we'd like them to be Get a little bit adventurous and they climb up and then get stuck so they're not hurt they just get stuck so i'd say that's probably the second most uh common injury but it's not an injury yeah if that Great answers answer, question. Right? <laughs> by the way i good job with the shoulders that's always tough to do for me too and i want to say big beehive little beehive my favorite hikes i've ever done in canada so for anyone who gets the chance i know you've got some edmonton groups today there that's a spectacular part of the world to hike so i'm so glad you guys again get to be there yeah i'd recommend everybody try it once at least yeah. Thanks, Aaron. All right, guys, we're going to do a rapid fire round of one more round of questions with everybody. Um, I'm going to take one quick one from YouTube and then Miss uh, uh, Hebert, I'm coming back to you in just a second. 
So Miss Royer's class wants to know on YouTube, has there ever been a situation where an animal's become a dangerous animal? Maybe a bear, maybe a moose, something where it's impacting people. Have you ever had to put down an animal in the park for any reason? Sarah? Yeah, so that's a really good question. So again, like I said earlier, most of the time, you know, animals and people are able to coexist, but sometimes animals, you're right, can become uh, dangerous. So sometimes we've had animals, it's most often when they come into conflict with people. So if they've received a lot of human food that's been left out, they might learn that they can come closer to people um, or, um, you know, something in a campground where people have left food out and, and bears can get into that. And yes, on occasion, we do have to remove those animals, but it's something we don't have to do very often. And it's something that we're really trying to work towards making sure that we reduce any reason that people might contribute to that. Yeah, so that's something that uh, as tourists to parks, as people who visit these parks, we can really do a, a lot of good work to make sure that they never have to be in that situation. And so be park smart, that's the whole essence of today's program. And I'm really glad we got that question as dark as it may be. So thank you for that, guys. All right, Miss Hebert's class, coming back to you guys in Scotch Plains. Take us away. All right, we have one. All right, come on. Uh, what is the most common animal seen on trails? The most oh. common animal seen on trails. So the most common animals is probably actually something a lot smaller. So there's a lot of birds. We had one that was uh, making some noise for us earlier while we were recording. Uh, so most often something small like a squirrel, um, or some birds flying around are some of the most common ones that people see. It really depends on where you go. Uh, people do tend to see animals maybe a little bit larger like uh, deer or elk, depending on where you're going and what time of year. Yeah. What was that bird making the noise earlier? I was going to interrupt the program to ask. So I'm so curious what you had near you. Oh, it was a nutcracker. <laughs> Ooh, very cool. Okay. Um, Miss Ella Claus, if you guys want to come on in and turn on your camera and mic again, ask another question, you are good to go. Hey, guys. All right. Go ahead. My question is, what are the few most important things you need to pack? Ooh, the most important things you need to pack. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> well, I would say if you're going for a hike, like one of the ones behind me, uh, what I would take in my backpack with me would be a cell phone, which is fully charged up. That's pretty important. Uh, not all areas in the back could you have a cell phone signal, but the ones behind me do certainly. And if you have a problem, you'll be able to call out and notify somebody like myself or Sarah to come and help you. And uh, secondly, I'd pack lots of warm clothing. Even in August, when it's hot, maybe where a lot of you people live, um, it can be really chilly and even snowing here. So I'd pack lots of warm clothing. And then the most important piece, though, is to be as prepared as possible with information so that you know you're going to the right place and you're doing something that's appropriate for your skill level. So uh, smartphones are great for that. You can um, upload all the information, maps and, and such onto that phone. Paper maps work too. But uh, the most important piece is to be doing that ahead of your trip. And uh, so you don't have any problems while you're on your trip. And if you go to that specific hike where you are right now, you can pack, you can have all that stuff, and you can go to the tea house on the trail and have a nice snack when you get there, which is one of the main benefits of Lake Louise, I think. So. Absolutely. Yeah, I'd recommend the carrot cake. <laughs> All right, let's head to Miss Kravis' class and then Miss Bowman's to wrap up. You guys are great, and I love all these great questions, everybody. Miss Kravis, back to Pickering. Take us away. How long have you been working there? How, how long have you been working there, Aaron? Myself, I'm just in my 15th year. It's been yeah. super fun. I'd, I'd highly recommend working for Parks Canada. I like that you ju said just my 15th year. That's incredible. What an amazing job. I, actually, I was going to ask that on behalf of our classes today. How do you end up in a cool role like this for our students that might want to be you in the future? What do they do? Well, uh, for, for my department, and then Sarah can come on after me and talk about her department, um, we employ um, ACMG mountain guides. And uh, that skill set is really important because we have avalanche training. We have training in climbing, um, avalanche forecasting, and things like that. So you can actually Google acmg.ca and uh, it's a, an association that talks about that certification stream and that's sort of our, our basic uh, qualification. And uh, there's 10 of us and there's lots of turnover. So we're looking for new recruits. So I hope you guys uh, apply to us. <laughs> Sign me up. Sarah, come and tell us a little more too. <laughs> Totally. And Sarah's going to come in and talk about her stuff. Yeah, don't fall in the snow. You got the transitions down pat now. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I'm entering my sixth year with parks. I started here as a student and for wildlife, uh, one of the things that we recommend people do is when you're done high school is to go and do some sort of post-secondary education. So there's a lot of biology or wildlife programs that kind of give us the tools that we need to be able to work with uh, the animals. Very cool, guys. Honestly, I always like to highlight these in Parks Canada programs because they're the coolest jobs in the world. You get to interact with people every day. You get to be outside for your jobs. You get to see people from around the world coming to visit such a special place and sort of show off Canada, tell hockey stick stories. Um, and it's, it's just fantastic. So for our students, again, if you get the chance to volunteer at parks when you're a little older, if you get the chance to visit, talk to park staff. Again, you will never meet uh, more enthusiastic people than team at Parks Canada. So great question, guys. All right, Ms. Bowman's class, wrap us up with one one final question. Come on in, fifth graders. Um, my question is, what would happen if you were separated and you had like no phone or any way of contacting anybody? I like it. I will let Aaron answer that. Uh, Aaron, come on in, man. <laughs> That's a good question. And we get this kind of thing happening a lot. Um, if you have no phone, I and mean, we'd like to think that you would have one, but if you don't, um, having a mental map of where you've been going that day is super helpful so that you can retrace your footsteps back to your group and or back to your car or back to your hotel or wherever you're staying. Um, that's a fairly uh, particular skill set. Um, not everybody has that, I suppose, and they do get lost, but uh, that would be the most important thing. And also have like a situational awareness of your surroundings and being observant as you're going on your hike or your climb in the national parks will help you be able to kind of remember where you're going but i think being able to backtrack to your group uh, is super important if that's not working out um, we recommend like you try that as much as you can but there comes a point in time where there'll be diminishing returns you're not making any progress you actually are legitimately lost and a stationary person is always easier to find a person that's constantly on the move um, yeah, that's pretty much about it did i answer your question yeah it's fantastic guys aaron sarah you guys are the best guest experts we've ever had on so thank you so much for this it's been a really fantastic time um before we bring back on kelsey to say a quick farewell in a minute i do want to just highlight for our classes i know some of you need to go in the next minute or so and so again check out uh the exploring by the seat of your pants peak program series this video will be linked on that site momentarily after this broadcast is done so you can watch it and all the other programs in the peak series if you have more questions for Sarah, for Aaron, for Kelsey, we are going to have a Padlet today. So if you head to Padlet.com, our initials, and WILD, you'll be able to share your questions there on a virtual whiteboard for the next couple of days and get those questions answered. Um, I'm going to bring back in Kelsey to highlight a few more quick things, and I'll bring up our fantastic Give Wildlife Space banner as well. Kelsey, wrap us up, and, and thank you so much again, everybody. Thanks, Jesse, and thanks for bearing with us here as we switch people out in front of the camera here. So I'd like to extend a big thank you to everyone who joined us live for the program today. Really hope you're able to come out to the national parks in the future and experience this incredible landscape for yourself. Always remember though, before you come on out, plan ahead, be prepared. There are a ton of great resources that you can check out online. Jesse has all of the links to share with you. So make sure you check all of that out and I will say a final farewell and pass it back to him. Fantastic. Kelsey, what an amazing program today. I will get all our classes, those links. If you registered for today's program, you'll get a big package at the end of this broadcast with absolutely everything, including that bear spray demonstration video, which I'm personally pretty excited about. Uh, but I'll bring back Kelsey and, and Sarah, Aaron, if you want to like position yourselves behind, you can all come in together. Uh, what we do to wrap up every broadcast, I'm going to give all our teacher friends a chance to come on in and say a big thank you and farewell. So Miss Hebert, Miss Bowen, Miss Kravitz, Miss Class, come on in. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye. Have a wonderful day, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.